Hello and welcome back to OT the Podcast. We are here to talk about watches, time and how to spend it. My name is Andy Green. Felix Schultz, reporting for duty. At ease, Felix. How are you going? Uh, pretty easy. Easy? Yeah. And breezy. Breezy. Easy breezy. Cover girl. <laughs> we have an easy breezy guest this week. Yes. Yes. It's a very relaxed personality. It was just nice. I really enjoyed this chat. It was like a, um, it's not something we've really done too much of before, like mm. a sort of a collection overview. Collector story type deal, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Nelson. Also known as? Uh, Jerry Says, as I uh, <laughs> incorrectly uh, interpreted that Instagram handle. Actually, Jerry's Eyes. So mm. an understandable mistake, Andy, and I'm sticking with it. Local Melbourne fella, uh, big, big kind of men's style, menswear. A lot of knit fits. A lot of knit fits for, for winter, our winter here in uh, Australia. Mm-hmm. Uh, came, he's come back with a really big passion into the watch scene over the last six months, and so we thought, let's get him on. We don't really, you know, everyday people. Let's, yeah. uh, let's have a chat to Jerry, and so we're going to have a chat to Jerry today. Uh, yeah, and genuinely, if you like this or want more of this sort of stuff, let us know. But yeah. do, you know, do you know what was missing from his collection, Andy? What? IWC. Yeah, there's no pilot's watch. Uh, maybe you can change for that. Um, mm. This week, of course, we're talking about IWC. They're sponsoring the episode. Check them out at IWC.com. Excellent URL or at a local boutique. Sydney or Melbourne in Australia is a good option. But, Andy, mm. I think we should probably – we've talked a lot in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've talked with IWC reps. We've talked about Top Gun. We haven't talked too much about the watches in some ways and what we think of them. We haven't, but there's two really standout pieces this year. Mm. They they sent Mm. these to me months ago now, and it was a brief brief encounter. It was maybe 24 hours. A brief encounter with the pilot kind. Mm, In and out. It was just a stopover at my my place. Uh, Transit lounge. (laughs) Terminal, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I, I had an even briefer. I had a you know forty five minute changeover um, looking at them uh, before the Top Gun movie. So mm. I'm very excited to have seen them. But w- so what are we talking about? Two watches. Mm-hmm. What are we going to start with, Andy? Let's start with the Pilot's Watch Chronograph Top Gun Edition Lake Tahoe. That's the white ceramic, uh, <sighs> white ceramic case, black dial with the white rubber strap. What do you think of it? I love this. This is this watch. The second I took it out, I sort of I got two, and we'll talk about the second one. But I, I grabbed this out. I looked at it. I put it on my wrist. The size was really quite nice. Wears small for forty four point five, if I'm honest, mm. that, because of the shorter lugs and the the strap. But it wears really comfortably. It's still got that presence that a, an IWC Pilot sort of watch has. Mm. The white ceramic. I mean, we've we've spoken to their you know head of materials. It's just such a cool achievement, but it looks really, really awesome on. It's I don't know. It's it's summery, but it's also not. It, it's it's a vibe. It's just a it's it's a vibey watch. And I, yeah. I remember just taking some photos and sending them to you, saying this is this is a seriously cool watch, like contender for probably one of the coolest watches of twenty twenty two. Oh really? I think so. And I think w- what I find most interesting about it is like it's quite polarizing. Like a lot of the sort of the social media commentary is like, oh, it's really cool, but I wouldn't wear it. Mm. It's sort of that mm. that sort of um, vein of discussion, but. I two things I think are really clever about it. I love the black dial. I think that keeps it uh, sort of utilitarian in aesthetic and you know true to the roots of the pilot's watch. Whereas otherwise, a white ceramic watch can risk looking like fashiony. Yep. Um, and I think they've done a really, really good job balancing out color. And I think it's even more like stark. And sort of unforgiving rather than that's what what it comes across as to me. Like this is like high design mm. rather than trend fashion. Yep. And the I think pushes add to mm. that as well, yeah. And I just think they've done a really good job sort of reframing a white ceramic watch, which is a hard thing to do, mm. into something cool and wearable. Yeah, I agree. It's got some stormtrooper energy to it. It's super comfortable. There's- is it? This watch is so hard to describe without seeing it. Like I genuinely recommend if you call your boutique, get on IBC.com, call your boutique and ask if they have one in to at least have a look at. Yeah. Yeah. In person, it's just stunning. And I, I, Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. Like this is one where I understand that perspective of like, oh, I don't think I'd wear a white ceramic watch. Certainly not. You know, it's 15900 Aussie dollars. That's mm. a fairly, you know, significant chunk of change for a watch i would suggest yeah like you say checking it out irl because very cool though it's a cool way to spend 16 grand yeah i liked it better in real life than in photos Mm, i agree and i I liked it in photos so you know (laughs) 
So it's got that IWC manufactured movement, automatic, of course, with the 46 hours of power reserve. Yep. And the caliber is the 69380. 15.7 millimeters high, which, you know, it's a chrono, so, but it's not, that's not particularly big for a, for a chronograph. Of course, it's, you know, integrated movement, 60 mm. meters water resistance. I think that'll get the job done yeah, for yeah. most things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, that height, there is a little bit of a dome to the crystal as well. So, yeah. you know, it's not full case thickness. Yeah, not but. full chunk. Uh, I don't remember, Andy. The, I'm pretty sure this has got the quick change straps as well. Hmm. I think it does. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. the I think the straps on these were really great, and I just mm. think get these on everything. Honestly. Exactly, and I mean these the specs we just talked about are also shared with the other watch we want to talk about, uh, the Pilot's Watch Chronograph Top Gun Edition Woodland. This is the green take, so same size, same movement, same functionality, but a very different green, which you might have seen on Tom Brady's wrist if you've been on the internet over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, and very different in vibe. Like the other one was like stark and super legible and, you know, minimalist contrast. This is like all green, like green dial, green strap, green case, green everything. Mm. Uh, Andy Green, I was kind of expecting you'd fall for this one. Uh, I thought about it, but the white really struck me as something cool. This, I mean, I feel like the, these two watches are like parts of a, a James Bond or a Jason Bourne movie where he like starts off in the Alps King, killing mm-hmm. some villains in all white and then makes his way through the forest. Sure. He's got the brand endorsed costume change. Yeah. yeah it's like, this, is like, yep. this is like the costume costume change and now he's kind of in the military, you know. Sure, 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 sure. Little. Uh, I think it's nice. I, again, this is one, what I, my take on this when I, I saw it in real life, it's less green than I expected. Mm, it's not super green. It's like I thought you, you – Looking at it in a dark room as I was, you could think it was like black or dark gray or something. Yeah. And again, the, the green ceramic is really quite eloquently done. It's not, it's not bright. It's sort of, there's a, there's a depth and a darkness to it, which sort of mirrors the sub dials that are, are yeah. sunbursty. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with the finish. Like polished ceramic is a very, um, you know, highly noticeable vibe. Whereas I think brushed or, you know, uh, how they've treated it here, it is a lot more low key. Yeah, this is very low key. I mean, this we're like a bomber jacket. Nice. Some jeans. White, white t shirt. White t shirt, white sneakers. So <laughs> mood. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, for more, head to IWC.com. Go check it all out. Head to your yeah, boutique. Definitely. Thank you, IWC. Yeah, so thank you, IWC. Keeping in the military mood, Andy, mm. I've been, uh, I've, I started watching it. I haven't finished it, to be honest. Um, I don't know if you know about this, but I love a terrible action movie. I've uh, gathered, yeah. Especially like nothing is better than like a late 80s, early 90s, Arnold Schwarzenegger sort of not too much thought involved 90-minute uh, romp. Yeah, it's peak Arnie. Yeah, classic Arnie. So I was very excited for many reasons to see uh, something pop up on my Netflix to watch Interceptor. Okay, it's on Netflix, good. Yeah, so there's an interesting story about this. Um, It's directed by a guy named Matthew Riley, who is an Aussie, um, and you might not know him because it's his debut film, Mm. but he is like a best-selling author of sort of, you know, your Tom Clancy-style military thriller. Uh, Mm. And he's he's quite cool. Like he was – he's been probably writing for like 20 years now, and he self-published because everyone thought, oh, this is too – over the top cheesy sort of, um, you know, high paced action. Like it's it's a sort of thing of like, and they're in a tank on a waterfall that was on fire with you know something like it's all very over the top, but it's enjoyable. Um, and he's made a movie which is re- you know it's got uh, Elsa Pataki, mm-hmm. uh, who you may know for being uh, Chris Hemsworth's wife. Uh, She's more than that, Felix. No, well, it's also relevant because Hemsworth produced it, and it's all ah. a little, a little um, uh, nexus of Australianness. Uh, and it's it, the 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 premise of the movie is, and I'm sure you'll see where this is going in terms of silly stupidness. Mm-hmm. It's essentially an oil rig in the middle of the ocean that exists to stop nuclear missiles, like it's a, an interceptor station, Ooh. if you will. Explains that, and uh, it's attacked by terrorists, and uh, I'm sure things get pretty hectic pretty quickly. But I, th- I think it's it's got to be enjoyable. It's got to be a bit stupid, but it's interesting because Matthew Riley, all his scripts have been bought by Hollywood, 
Mm. Um, this movie is now number one globally. It's been watched wow. by, for something like 50 million hours in the first week or whatever it is. Uh, but his problem was that all his movies would have been too big to make. Like he sort of said in this Variety interview, they're $150 million movies. Yeah. Uh, and that's too much of a gamble for like a an unknown prospect. So this was – he wrote this specifically to be designed to be filmed in a single location and to be cheap. Hmm. Uh, right. And it, it sort of can deliver everything of it. So I think it's a really fascinating test platform – of like this guy who's quite smart at what he does to go, okay, you can't make all these movies because they're too big. I get that. I'm going to prove it with this, you know, 20 or $30 million film that the premise works and there's an appetite for it and then you can make my other movies. Yeah. That's a smart play to get get into, you know, Hollywood and... Yeah, and like he's got the name and clearly he's got the connections and, you know, he sort of worked all those angles. But, uh, you know, he's already written a sequel because he, I don't know, writes like... He's probably wrote it in three weeks. You know, he's that kind of uh, very, uh, you know, quick sort of process. But anyway, uh, we'll chuck up the trailer. If you're in the mood for some, you know, cheesy popcorn thriller, give it a watch. Hmm. I'll have to check. Maybe chuck it on tonight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Let me know how you go with it. Hey, one other thing, Andy, before we talk about what else we have to talk about and get on to Jerry. Have you been following the news around Norcane? I saw a headline. Uh, a headline or two that JCB, Jean-Claude Viver, has joined the board. Do you know much about it? A little bit. Now, we really haven't uh, – this is really interesting. Like, we haven't spoken about this brand too mm. much, uh, but maybe we should because there's um, a lot. There's quite a lot going on with them for a young brand. So they were founded in, like, 2018-ish. Mm. Um, so, what, five years ago, four or five years ago. But they've already – to get JCB on your board – um, they've got Kinesi Manufacture, so the same people making Tudor's movements, or Tudor's automatic movements are making these guys' movements. Um, there's some serious pedigree in the management. Uh, the one of the four, the son of the former owner of Breitling, uh, ice hockey guy uh, Mark Strait, who's won the Stanley Cup, is sort of on board as like the you know high profile owner. Uh, the founder is Ben Cuffer, who's Spent eleven years at Breitling, and his dad ran a you know for fifty or forty five years, you mm. know worked in like private label watchmaking. So there's a lot of experience behind this brand, and they're doing some fairly impressive things in a very short amount of time. And I think we should be paying attention to them. Yeah, they've come a long way. I mean, you can't stop seeing them. You can't stop talking about them. They're, you mentioned they're stocked on Hodinkee. Yeah, they've, they've got like a hundred points of sale or something already. Yeah. Which is wild. I mean, just kind of stealthily growing their brand, which is a cool way to do it. I just, um, for me, um, I just want their designs to mature a little bit. Mm. I'm not, there's some stuff that I think is a bit weird. Could tighten it up? Yeah. I mean, they've got a really strong pitch. Like they're going after this whole sort of sustainability thing. Like there's no, I don't think they've got any animal products in their um, uh watch in there anything you know there's like animal cruelty free like they've got Mm. you know vegan straps they've got you know uh upcycled uh ocean straps all that sort of stuff going on so interesting and i want to see you know them you know in 10 years i think that you know we we talk about like what's next for watch brands like we're seeing the same old you know legacy names is this a new brand that's going that has what it takes to you know survive and thrive for you know 10 15 years into the future Mm. Well, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to know. get the guys from Norquane on. I think we might know some people, Andy. Speaking of knowing people, Felix, mm. we know some people that make some of the best sailcloth straps Oof. right here in Australia. I am, of course, talking about Artem Straps. Artem. Uh, yes, artemstraps.com, artem.straps on Instagram. Have you been wearing any Artem Straps recently, Andy? I'm always throwing an Artem NATO around the place, Felix. <laughs> I mean, the, the, you don't have to worry about it because they're tough, and if you throw it, it's not going to be damaged too much. It'll survive. I did get a bit of uh, a bit of protein shake on one the other day, so I just got, had to give it a little bit of a quick clean. Oh yeah, a bit of dish soap. Okay, and, uh, a bit of a, a gentle brush, and wow. then just let it air dry on some paper towel. And it was good as new. I just I just would leave the protein shake there and just call it patina. Save it for later. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, we don't recommend putting protein straps, uh, sorry, protein powder on your Artem straps, but there's no doubt that they could handle it. The NATOs are especially 
tough, very thick mm. nylon, a uh, little little satiny, a little, very supple and luxurious even. Yeah, uh, all black is the latest color in the collection, and I'm sure it's not the last. They've been teasing more colors to come. I'm always teasing the, the guys at Artem, but mm. check them out. Uh, check them out, artem.straps, uh, artemstraps.com. Uh, buy one. They're great. Get some accessories, it. different size spring bars, tools, mm. even the lipless straps. Mm. Have a look. It's amazing service and well worth the money. i got one final question. Uh-huh. Would you wear one on the basketball court? Yeah, for sure. It's, it would be very sporty and comfortable. Speaking of basketball courts and getting your value, <laughs> um, getting your money worth, Netflix this week has been uh, top tier hustle on Netflix. Felix Adam Sandler's new uh, new film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's uh, it's about a, a down on his luck basketball scout, which Adam Sandler plays, who kind of finds this non professional player abroad, and he kind of brings him back to the states to try and get him uh, get him in the league and. The, the trouble that he faces when he doesn't have the, the approval from the, the team he works for. It's very good. It's got 90-plus ratings across the board. I think it's one of Adam Sandler's best films. Can I just say, Adam Sandler excels at Down on His Luck. Yeah. I mean, you watch this and, you yeah, this role was made for him because it's got the right level. Like, he's got its, his humour in it. It's his drama. It's... Yeah, the, the down on his luckness is is very Adam Sound. It, it, it's, it's pretty brilliant. It's up there with um, with uncut gems. I don't know. Adam Sound is getting really good with with age, and I guess I, yeah, uh, uncut gems was far, <laughs> was far too stressful for me to watch. Is this stressful? No, 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 no. It's really it's quite motivating. It's quite okay. very wholesome. Um, it's border, borderline on a beautiful beautiful film. From Adam Sandler. Okay, 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 cool, 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 cool. I'll check it out. Add it to the list. You don't really need to get the sportiness of it. That's fine. Uh, what could I compare it to? A little bit of Blindside. Energy. I was, I was going to say the Blindside. Is this uh, Adam Sandler as Sandra Bullock? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> less, less, uh, less so. But it is really good, and it's a reminder that Adam Sandler is a fantastic actor. Yes, easy to forget that. He's I, I he seems to have like a, a ratio of like terrible 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 incredible terrible terrible mm. terrible incredible. But maybe oh, yeah. he's flipping that around up to more incredible recently. Well, years ago he had that deal with Netflix for like four four movies. I think it was 100 million dollars or something for four films. Is this is this the last one, do you reckon? No, I think he fulfilled it. So they've they've come back for more because regardless of if it's good or not, people will watch. Like they've they've done the maths and they're like, yeah. Everyone will watch an Adam Sandler film, regardless of if it's good or not. Like they will just watch him. So, uh, yeah, let's check it out. Put a trailer up. Check it out. Uh, before we get Jerry, is there anything else happening? Yeah, well, you sent me a message. Uh, oh, yeah. You sent me a message a couple of days ago hmm. from someone you know pointing out hmm. a, a, a mechanical keyboard keycap set. Mm-hmm. Uh, what bit of a? Well, I think it's James Bond themed. It's called MW Cultured, hmm. uh, and it had a watch. Keycap mm-hmm. as part mm-hmm. of it, metal mm-hmm. keycap. Yeah, and I said, yep. <laughs> I basically designed that keycap, Felix. Uh, is that what the kids call an artisan? It's an artisan. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, a company that I'm that I am involved with called Hibby, uh, which is Hibby.mx on Instagram. And check it out. Ooh, that MX Flex. Yeah, yeah. we've got a watch. I mean, there's a Discord as well for that, and there's a watch sub channel because a lot of keyboard guys are into watches. So Jeez, maybe some watch guys and keyboards. So many discords. Hey, uh, mm-hmm. quick question. I've never asked you this before. Hibby.mx, is that a mm-hmm. reference to the popular Melbourne daily street paper from the late 90s and early 2000s? MX? How did you know? It's a, yeah, it's in its honour. <laughs> No, we should uh good. is that uh sale up for a while that uh group buy it's probably got three weeks left in it so it's a okay. pre-order um the if you know anything about mechanical keyboards milky way is the is the profile very similar to cherry it delivers pretty quickly so it'll be probably six months or something and the uh the artisan that Hibby's doing is a metal with a mm, octagonal, in- octagonal. In- integral yeah it's pretty simple it's quite interesting you can only do so much with what is it a- it's CNC machined aluminium, so you can only do so much as far as detail goes. So I just, want, I just want to get this reference out. Would you say the person that would have designed the watch, the watch that it was inspired by, was a gent? Yeah, it was a gent for sure, mm-hmm. for okay. sure. So if you're interested, really, actually, you can head to dailyclack.com and place a pre-order in. Links. We'll put them link, in the show up. notes. We'll link it up, but it's a uh, yeah. Get around it, Felix. Nice. Let's do it. Uh, you know what else we need to get around? Is it Jerry's eyes? <laughs> Yes. So they just stare into my soul from my Instagram feed. I've heard some of Jerry's voice. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, let's get Jerry on. 
Andy, this is one episode where it's a pity that podcasting is an audio medium. Mm. Because today's guest, Jerry Nelson, is seriously stylish. Uh, we'll have to imagine the fits in our mind. And also, mm. we'll have to imagine his very stylish watch collection. Welcome to OT Jezza Says. Did I say that right, first of all? Jezza's Eyes. Jezza's Eyes. eyes. Oh, it's it's one okay. Of those things. It's uh, not the worst thing I've been called. People call me Giza <laughs> after looking Giza. at that. Giza. Oh, Giza. Giza's Eyes. That makes a lot more sense. I've always just sort of, you know, you, uh, you imagine something in your head, but you've never said it out, li- out loud. And this oh, is yeah. the first time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of those situations where I'm I'm saying your Instagram handle for the I first time. Anyway. <laughs> Jezza's eyes. Welcome, Jezza. Thank you very <laughs> much. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Uh all right, so we we gotta start with a few icebreakers given how given how cold Melbourne is at the moment. Uh how are you handling the cold? What's your go to winter fit? What's my go oh, I'll tell you what I'm wearing today. I've got a I've got flannel trousers. Brown mm-hmm. lamb's wool flannel trousers, a pair of grain, scotch grain boots, a turtleneck, and mm-hmm. an overcoat. Always cozy. That's one thing always about co- Yep. It's always cozy. Uh, co- speaking of cozy, we were having a chat just beforehand because uh, last week's episode, well, uh, we, we, we saw Top Gun. We saw Top Gun recently, mm-hmm. um, and we're all talking about call signs. Um, I think I've worked out what Andy's call sign is, but Jerry, would you have a call sign? Would it be cozy? Either cozy or clothes horse. I think I'm trying to change my call sign, but that's what I'd be at the moment. Yeah, fair enough. What was yours, Felix? Uh, Well, you, because as as we now all know, we can't choose our own uh, call signs. They have to be given to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I came up with flex for you in the end, Andy. Mm-hmm. And you, you, we didn't pin me down. I suggested meat hook, mm. um, but for my giant wrists. But I don't think we we achieved any sort of consensus on it. What do you think, Jerry? What can we? What can Felix's call sign be? Ooh, good question. TikTok. 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 Yeah, that's good. Or or Andy, you could be tick. I could be talk. <laughs> quirky, quirky vintage bow ties. <laughs> Long. <laughs> I haven't put a bow tie. I can never remember how to tie a bow tie. It's one of those things that every time, like every two to three years, whenever I put a bow tie on, mm. I just have to YouTube it. It's not It's not in the muscle memory. Join the club. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. I, I was worried about the validation there from, from you, Jerry. But um, do you have a, a clip on bow tie? Is there a sort of. No, a- I don't. I have a uh, proper, you know, one we have to tie. Yeah. Somebody actually, a friend of mine, gave me some good, some good advice, and what he said was tie it like you tie a pair of shoelaces, and I've done that, and it kind of works. Yeah. And then never fully undo it so that it sort of remains the same sh- shape, and just slip it on and off your head. You know uh, what? I the- think I think part of it is that you don't want that perfection. You mm. want it to look like you've tied it. Yeah, that's the flex. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam Sandler style, just careless, effortless, effortless scrub. Um, okay, so you mentioned that you are traveling to Malaysia in a few days or next week. I am. What are you going to be taking outfit wise for for Malaysia? What's the what's the weather this time of year? It is constantly hot. It's mm-hmm. either dry or wet. So my my go to for traveling over there has been uh, drawstring linen trousers. I've got a few mm-hmm. pairs of those. Uh, T shirts. It's hard to wear jackets. So I might take a linen overshirt, but it tends to be T-shirts and trousers. And what goes really well uh, over there with the trousers are unlined loafers. Mm-hmm. So that will take you from the plane to pretty much anywhere you want to go. If you want to dress up, you could put a jacket on or put um, just a thin cotton shirt on or a linen shirt and you'll be sorted out. Yeah, right. Fair enough. I don't think I, I could handle Malaysia very long. Um, <laughs> it's too humid. I don't. I don't work well in humidity. You risk um, double in size. Well, yeah. Um, the next, the obvious question, perhaps given given the nature of our uh, podcast, uh, Jerry, what watch will you be taking? Ooh, 
Okay. So I've, as you know, I've got a few nice watches, which we will talk about. But the one I will be taking is my Oris Big Crown Point today. Because, and it, that's on a steel bracelet. Yep. So that's a, a Gada watch, go anywhere, do anything kind of watch. Um, mm-hmm. I don't plan to be diving with it. So it's got some kind of water resistance and it pretty much goes with anything. The really cool thing about this watch is that this is the what they call the black dial. But it's actually a bitter chocolate. So it's a really dark brown color. And what that means is it kind of takes on the characteristics of the clothes you wear with it or the strap. Interesting. Yeah. So if I put a black leather strap on it, the dial looks black. If I put a brown leather strap, it takes the brown characteristics. And same with the clothes. So I've got a honey colored turtleneck on today. And I've got the watch on and it's looking decidedly brown. So, yeah, it's a nice watch, and I love the I love that it doesn't have a date window. It's actually got a date pointer hand. It points the date on the dial. Um, yeah, so that's what I'll be taking with me. And, you know, I think with these things, you don't want to take things that might get damaged, might mm. get lost, whatever it is. So the rest will be in a vault over here, and this is what I'll be taking with me. I like it. And we're going to get into the details of your watch collection and how you've built it out in a little bit. But given that we're talking about, you know, style and menswear, you strike me as one of those, you know, one of the old school style forum fellas. Yep. Been into it for a long time. I'm really curious as to how you got interested in watches, how you began, began collecting them. Did you find them through sort of menswear? Not exactly. So Mm -hmm. when I turned, so I'm 54 now. And when I turned 40, I decided I wanted to get a Rolex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was, I was talking to my wife and the one that appealed to both of us was the blue face two-tone Submariner. So really that, that was my first foray into, you know, what I'd consider high-end watches the one before that, that I'd actually saved and saved and saved to get was, uh, 2000 series tag Hoyer quartz watch love it yeah yeah that's what i started off with and you know at the at the time i was in university a friend of mine had one and i thought you know at the end of summer i was um actually studying and um teaching at the same time so i was putting all my money aside so that when i went back to malaysia i'd get that watch and i had the tag Hoyer catalog i'd be looking at the catalog every night i'd be taking that catalog and putting it on my wrist to imagine that watch on my wrist. And uh, when I finally went back and got it, it was like, it was amazing. That was the first time I got a really nice watch. And that kind of stayed with me for about, oh, must have been at least 10 years, 10, 12 years. The next big thing was the Rolex. And that kind of started it off. Now, when I got the Rolex, I loved wearing the watch. I always found that it stood out. You know, it's got a beautiful blue dial. Yep. It's got the two-tone bracelet and the Mm. case as well so it stands out and i wasn't sure i it quite fit with the way i was um so i wore it but for a lot of the time i'd wear it under my sleeve okay Mm, that's fair but you know the thing is back at the time i was looking at when i got this watch i started getting getting interested in other rolexes and that's when i started looking at um, the price of secondhand rolex watches and you know, at the time, you could have walked into a store and got pretty much any model you wanted, uh, apart from stainless steel Daytonas, both blackface and whiteface. Anything you wanted, you could have walked in and picked it up. Even the secondhand prices, you know, I cry now <laughs> when I think what I could have gotten Pepsis for or subs for back then. But yeah, hindsight's twenty three. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that, yeah, that was the, that was the start. Yeah. That was the start. And, um, and you know, at the time I looked at getting another Rolex and thought, oh, this is just, you know, I can't justify spending that amount of money. Uh, and that's where I stopped. I stopped for about 14 years. Um, really? Until, sep- well, I guess until May last year. So around May last year, I went for a birthday dinner, for a friend's birthday dinner, and there were, there were some other watch guys there. And, you know, they started talking to me about watches. Actually, I'll take a step back. Up till that point, right, I had friends who were into watches and they talked to me, you know, reeling off um, reference mm. numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And these were serious collectors, uh, vintage Rolexes, Pateks, um, APs, that kind of thing. They'd reel off the references and I, not knowingly, not knowing a single thing about them, 
Mm. I just, you know, sagely smile and say, yeah, yeah, yes, okay. And when I went to that dinner, they started talking about them. And this friend said, you know, I think what would suit your style would be a Kuruno Tokyo. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. They do really cool um, classic style watches. So that got, that got me thinking again. And I put myself on the mailing list to find out when the next one would be coming out. Then they announced the Toki, which was the yeah. salmon-colored, well, it's the color of the feathers of a Japanese ibis, but it's at all intents and purposes. It's kind of a salmon colored dial. Yep. Um, and I ended up being right at the end because with Corona, it's a bit of a strange process. They either have a limited number or in this case, they had a limited window of time to buy the watch. It was 10 minutes between wow. midnight and 1210. You had to put your order in. And they promised to actually uh, fulfill every order that was put in. So anyway, I got I got put at the end of the list. And uh, I guess it was going to arrive sometime this year. So what happened was, around September time, the company I was working for was quite kind to me. And the, the bonus that we got was pretty good. So nice. I, already, I already had watches in my mind at this time. And I mm -hmm. started talking to my friends about this. And the one I really wanted was a nice dress watch because I couldn't, didn't feel that I'd wear that Rolex all the time. And the thing that stuck in my mind was a reverser, a reverser, just the classic white face reverser. Now, the money came in. I was looking for, for one of these. And I was thinking, you know, I'd be very happy with the Mono Face Classic. But if, you know, if the stars aligned, I would love a duo face. Because just the idea of it's awesome. Mm. So just for anyone who's not familiar with the Reverso, with a monoface, the Reverso is called a Reverso because you can flip the watch. And on the back is a stainless steel back. It was originally made for playing polo back in India. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, uh, so it's probably one of the first sports watches. Um, although nobody would think of it that way now. No. But yeah, it was designed so... Um, you could flip the case and the mallet of the polo, you know, the, the polo mallet handle wouldn't damage the glass. Yeah. So, so um, I was looking, I was considering, and I saw a secondhand Reverso Duo Face come up for maybe a couple of hundred dollars more than the Mono Face. So I was right in there. Mm -hmm. That's how it all started. You were back in. That's how the deluge started. I think quite soon after I got that, I might have messaged you, Andy. You did, yeah. I'm back in the game. Yeah, there was a, you <laughs> literally messaged. I'm back in. I'm back in watches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> which, which I love. I, lo I love that you sort of you took you know nearly two decades off and just enjoyed, you know your your Rolex and Mariner and and then all of a sudden you've come back. And what struck me was in a short amount of time you've sort of built out a really well rounded collection. And it's, it's almost, you know, I said to Felix the other day, it's almost like you've kind of done, there's, there's some sort of list here of, you know, a watch for every occasion um, or there's a, you know, there's every category of watch. Um, where, like, what's your approach been generally speaking with sort of buying the last sort of half dozen of watches? Maybe we can, you know, we've talked about the Auras okay. and the JLC, yep. but did you have a have a goal when you got back into watches of I want to kind of get this or get this? Um, what, what was the approach? Oh, look, it kind of evolved, mm -hmm. and you know, you hit the nail on the head better than I could. It's really a watch for every occasion. And I was talking to a good friend of mine who's in Sydney, and we were talking in terms of use cases. So I got the JLC. And I was thinking, yeah, this is a dress watch. It would be nice to have an everyday kind of a watch where I wasn't too worried about it. And he suggested the big crown point to date, the Oris. So that was the next one I got. And that one comes with a strap. So I actually had to find a bracelet for it. Now, I was thinking after that, you know, that got me thinking about where I'd want to go next. And after talking to him, I was thinking, I need, not I need, because you really I mean, I think need is an exaggeration. I want a gold dress watch. And so began the hunt and the search and the consideration of all the different models, you know, from the Pate Calatrava to the um, AP Traditionnel 
the Audemars Jules, um, Lange, Breguet, all of those. So those were all kind of bubbling in my mind, but the price point was just right up there. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was something to save for and wait for. So I, that was always in the back. So in the meantime, I, I started looking at, you know, other occasions where I'd wear watches and different types of watches. So, you know, going back to your question, what I've realized is this collection was built in terms of watches being a component of your outfit, which is why I don't have really outlandish dials. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything that stands out, but more things that uh, complement what I'm wearing. So, you know, if you were to look at my watches, they're just white dials, black dials, and you know, in one case, it's a champagne-colored one, but they they tend to fit what I'm wearing. So um, after I got after I got the Langer, uh, sorry, not Langer, after I got the JLC, we're skipping ahead there. I um, I was thinking about a chronograph, and you know, it'll be nice to have a chrono in the collection, but which one? Daytona's were firstly, you know, out of my price point. Secondly, unobtainable. Um, you know, without any kind of purchase history, without um, any kind of connection there, unless you're willing to pay gray market prices, which is, you know, probably a down payment for a mortgage or something, you would be able to get a Daytona. So that was off the list. And Speedmasters were, you know, ubiquitous. They're kind of everywhere. I wanted something a bit different that still had that classic um, provenance to it. And what I settled on was the El Primero, and not just any El Primero, not the El Primero Defy, not the uh, El Primero Sports Chronomaster, the original 1969 design with the tricolored dial. It's a nice size. It's I think the one I've got is um, 38 mils. Yeah, it's right. a really lovely size, really classic design. And I actually put it on a rally strap. So that, that's another thing. I don't mind swapping out the stock straps for anything else. Um, what I found, you know, I feel like I'm kind of going all over the place, so please forgive me for that. But going back to the Reverso, what struck me about the Reverso was that, you know, the Reverso has two faces, the duo mm -hmm. face anyway, a black face and a white face. And the strap comes with quick release spring bars, which I didn't know existed because I'd been out of this whole watch thing for 14 yeah. years. Innovation, yeah. The, the most would... significant innovation in the watch industry. <laughs> My <laughs> God, yeah. So I got a brown strap and I got a black strap aftermarket. The, the cool thing about the JLC deployment clasp is that you can take it off and put it on without any need for tools. You just press yeah, a bit right. of it. And it comes off. So I didn't need a tool to swap straps. So with the black strap and the brown strap, I essentially had four dress watches. Um, yeah, you do too. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that was mind-blowing to me. So going back to the El Primero, once I got that, you know, I got a rally strap for it, a dark brown rally strap, because I felt that if any watch would go well with the rally strap, it would be this one, a chronograph. And, you know, to me, it's just a... It looks stunning. I don't feel like this watch was meant to be on a bracelet. I think it's meant to be on a strap and especially a rally strap. So that was that was the next one I got. And then I kept looking. So I've been saving up the money for um, the gold dress watch. So, you know, I'd spent some of it on this um, El Primero. And what happened was a Lange came up for sale secondhand, a two- 2013 Langer. Now, this is a Saxonia. So it's a classic dress watch, mm. two hands and a small seconds dial. And the finishing is stunning. The movement has got the German silver inside on the back or German nickel, one of them. But, you know, the movement is as stunning as the front of the watch. And so what I did was I traded in my Rolex. So the Rolex <gasps> went. It's gone. Really? It's gone. After all that time. After all that time, because, you know, as I said, I wasn't wearing it. Fair. You know, yeah, I wore it to work for, I wore it to work for five years at least. 
nobody knew I had a watch because it was always under my sleeve. I never felt comfortable yeah. showing it. Um, I never felt comfortable having it out on the train. Um, I you know, at one time on the train, some kids noticed it and, you know, they were good about it. It's like, oh, my God, is that a real Rolex? And, you know, they were nice about it and all that. But I, it just kind of made me feel a little it's uncomfortable. A it's a reality check in some ways, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, Melbourne's it's, a safe place. Yeah. Mm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm really interested. Do you find the solid gold of Langer less ostentatious than a two-tone Rolex? Yes, the two-tone oh. Rolex has a striking blue dial. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the Langer doesn't have a gold bracelet as well. So, yeah. you know, it comes with that. It comes with the reptile, a brown reptile um, strap, mm. which I've switched to a dark green one because I don't mind switching straps now. But um, to me, you would wear it on certain occasions. And um, I don't feel it stands out as much as the two-tone sub. Mm, and I yep. think what it is is that blue dial, which is a yeah, standout. So. It's a standout, but too much of a standout for me. It's really fair. I think it's really interesting. So you, like we were sort of talking about, and Andy mentioned, you've got a collection that's that's been assembled quite quickly in some ways. Yes. That covers off a lot of bases. So we've got the, the formal dress with the langer, that sort of less, uh, less dressy, more versatile with Verso. Classic chronograph with the Zenith. Yep. Uh, we haven't even mentioned the 50 Fathoms. We'll, no. We'll, we'll 50 Fathoms. We'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. And you've got that sort of do anything watch with the Aura. So this is, these are like five great pillars. But what I find fascinating is that they're not, none of them are the expected choice. Like, yes. It's not a Saab. It's not a Calatrava. It's not a Speedmaster. It's not a Seiko, you know, whatever, whatever else. Was that deliberate? Was that conscious or did that just end up like that? It was a little bit conscious. I didn't want to I didn't want to have what everyone else had. But you know, it, it's not something where you know, for example, say the John Mayer Gold Daytona, right? Not everybody has mm. that, or the Tiffany um Nautilus. Um you know, all these watches are at relatively decent price points. I mean, maybe not the Langer, but compared to compared to the equivalent. You know, if you're mm. comparing the Langer to a uh, Patek Calatrava or an AP Traditionnel, um, you know, it would probably be the lowest priced of the three. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so I wanted I wanted watches that would stand out, but I also wanted watches that had that bit of history to them and it would be a nod to other watch aficionados you know that mm. the tribe would recognize me in other words you know what yeah. i mean is is that important in uh, and this is sort of coming back to that broader mm. um you know where watches fit into a sort of more broader style Yes. Is it is it this for you? Is it an extension of the same discourse? Like it's part of the outfit, it's part of the look, or is it a separate, discrete category? For me, it's part of the look. I enjoy them for how beautiful they are. You know, mm. I love photography and I photograph these watches all the time, but it needs to be a cohesive part of the outfit, and that's why. I didn't have any occasion where I'd wear the Kuruno Tokyo once I got it. So mm -hmm. that watch that watch went as well. Um, I sold it for pretty much what I paid for it, you know, not to flip it to make a profit or anything, just to sell it to someone who'd appreciate it. And the guy who bought it loved it. He came with his fiance, looked at it, said he dreamed of getting one, but wasn't able to. So I was really happy I was able to help him with that. Um and I was really happy I was able to make room in my collection for something else. Uh, just because there's no point having something you don't wear. You know, I've got all these nice watches. And, you know, if you go to my Instagram, I put a picture of my outfit most days. Mm. And with the picture is a picture of the watch I'm wearing as well. So I'll have a pocket shot in there mm. or wrist shot. And if you go through it, you'll see that I wear all these watches equally. I don't really favor one over the other. 
Oh, just, I reckon the Blanc Pan's been been favoured of late, but I'm guessing that's the newest purchase. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> I mean, I guess we'll get into it. Um, it is a special piece, and I'm smiling as I say this. So uh, why is it a special piece? Oh, the sapphire bezel. I've never mm-hmm. seen anything like it. Um, when I was looking at the sub, after I got the sub, I looked at other dive watches, and um, mm. apart from the Rolex sub, the Blanc Pan stood out because it, it was a dive watch, but it didn't look like a sub. It didn't look derivative. It mm-hmm. looked like its own thing. Mm. And before I even knew the history of it, um, I just loved the way it looked. And the thing that made it stand out for me was the um, sapphire glass on the bezel. And what size have you got? It's a 45 mil. How do you find that 45 mil? Because you can. But have... yes, 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 yes. Yep. You know, on paper, <laughs> it sounds huge. It sounds like. Uh, a monster, but the lugs are quite short, uh-huh. so it actually wears smaller than you'd think. It's also a thick watch; it's about fifteen and a half mils thick. Yeah. Now I'm not going to wear this with a dress shirt and a suit. <laughs> actually, what I find is I tend to dress like Captain Birdseye <laughs> wearing <laughs> this. So you know, I'm wearing like a navy double-breasted coat. I'm wearing a turtleneck. Mm. I'm pretending I'm sailing on North Sea. But really, I'm just going to the CBD. Yeah, well, I've got to say, I've got to say, Jerry, I noticed you're in uh, Adrian Barker's Facebook group, Felix and I are in there as well, oh, talking, yeah. watches, drinking coffee. And every time you post you post a photo in there, there's like half a dozen people asking you if, where you got your sweater from. So you, you have impeccable <laughs> taste in sweaters. I have an addiction to knitwear. I like nice knitwear. Uh-huh. And it varies. Um, if we, Yeah, if we can go off track for a sec. Please, yeah, tell uh, us. So... I like turtlenecks from William Lockie in Scotland. I like because they make a lot of turtlenecks for a lot of well-known brands like uh, Drake's as well. You get theirs from William Lockie, and the quality is just stunning. Really warm, really soft, but really well made. I've got a very very nice turtleneck that I'm wearing today from Christian Kimber. Oh that, yeah, yeah, that was in his last winter collection. And one thing with turtlenecks that I find is that sometimes the neck can droop. But mm, cool. with this one, it just, you know, it gently, it, it gently holds the neck and stays in place. You know, being on Instagram uh, has been good because there's, a, there's an Irish brand called Inish Main, and okay. they, they're in the Aran Islands. You know, it's a really beautiful, beautiful place in Ireland, but they just do simply, the, you know, some of the most stunning knitwear you'd hope to see. Mm. And you know, if we ever meet in winter, I will wear one of those, and you can see for yourself. Um, they're thick, but they just feel really soft. And they were kind enough to send me a couple of their turtlenecks. Wow! This is maybe in 2019, and I wore one of those when I went to the Falklands. So back in the Instagram, um, back then, there's a picture of me wearing one of the turtlenecks on the Falkland Islands in five degree weather. But yeah, so I have. Um, a few turtlenecks from a few different places. Uh, but I'm also a huge fan of shawl collared cardigans. And, you know, sometimes they say it's grandpa style, but yep. it's really all about the fit. You know, if I were to digress a bit, you know, if you were yep. to get a Harrington jacket, which is a light, a light summer kind of jacket, the sizing can either make you look like James Dean or Walter White, <laughs> pre Heisenberg. Yeah, 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 yeah. So same thing with the short collared cardigan. If you get one that's too big, you can look like a granddad. So you got to size it right. You got to size it right. Yeah, don't don't worry about it being fitted because I've had people on style forums saying, you know, I want to get a short collar cardigan, and they actually mention me that they like the way I look in it, and it's mm-hmm. because I don't go. I go by the measurements of the cardigan as opposed to the size. So some places give the measurements, and I go by those as to what would be well-fitting. So, yeah, I've got a love of knitwear, um, Fair Isle jumpers, uh, Shetland wool jumpers, all that kind of thing. I've just got way too many, way, way too many, but I love them, absolutely. They look good. A a nice cuff with a a wrist shot makes uh, all the difference. It's the textures, man. Yeah. It's all about the texture and the color. And I think yeah, with those, you're right. That 45 millimeter blanc pan does not look out of place. You can, you know, 
It, it Thanks for pulling us back. <laughs> no, 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 that's absolutely fine. Um, I was brought into mind of a, a phrase that uh, Hadinki used a little bit, and I do love it, uh, horological c- cosplay. <laughs> yep. Which is like you know when you've got your you got your dive watch or your astronaut watch and you're you're pretending you're um you're doing something you are in no way qualified for and I think it's it's one of the great things about watch collecting. Oh my god, um, I'm pretending I'm Jacques Cousteau. Yeah, <laughs> taking the train into the city. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's raining outside. I need a thousand meter dive watch. Um, uh, one thing I was thinking about and i was thinking about it when you were talking about your relationship with your uh two-tone rolex do you think and this is you know maybe relates to style as well like style versus fashion do watches go out of fashion was that uh and is that something that can is a, a factor for you you've got to find your own identity through watches i don't think they go out of fashion i think it's all about the context So by that, I mean, you know, if you were to get a two-tone Santos, it's a very 70s style watch. Or if you were to get a Glasuta original 70s, you know, Mm. with that square case. Yeah, that television style look. Yep, It's very much a product of its time, but I think it looks classic in the right context. So I think it's the same with a lot of watches. you know, even swatches, you might say they're product of the 80s or whatever it is, but they still look good now. Even Drake's, which is a classic brand, uh, was using them in their lookbooks, you know, in the 2000s, late 2000s or early 2000s. Yeah, right. Yeah. Wow. So I, I don't think watches go out of date or out of fashion. Um, you know, there, there are even people using pocket watches now. Yeah, that's a um, that's a that's a that's a strong look. I think <laughs> it to, is to, to to daily a pocket watch that that takes some commitment. I, I'm also wondering. So you've built this collection in the last year or couple of years, whatever it is. Ooh, six months. No, maybe not since September. Oh, moves fast. Mad moves fast. Since September. Oh, please. So yeah. uh, we, we've talked about those five key pieces. Yep. What is do you have an end point or is there going to be something next? Do you know, like, what's what's n- slot number six in the watch box? Okay. It's funny you mentioned that because there is only one slot left in that watch box. Sure. It's a six-slot watch box, and I don't intend to get any more than that. But, okay, before I go into that, you could make the argument that the collection is complete as is and there's sure. anything more. Because right now I've got a watch for every occasion, you know, from the most formal to the most casual and I could stop right here and be happy. You could stop at any time. That's what they all say. Yeah. You know, I could have stopped after one watch, man, to be honest. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. It's not, once you go past one or two watches, it becomes more of a case of want rather than need. But yeah. given the crowd we're in and given the topic we're talking sure, about. Sure, sure. No, no, no shame. I'm thinking about an integrated bracelet watch. Ooh. That's, well, that's like missing from the question. Interesting. And for me, that would complete it. Uh-huh. Any any hints or thoughts as to what that might be <laughs> at this point? Or are you going to keep those cards close to your chest? Oh, plenty of thoughts. Plenty okay. of thoughts. And I'm an open book, so I'll tell you what I've been looking at. Go I on. have – okay. I have looked at a Piaget Polo. I've looked at a Zenith Defy. Mm-hmm. I've looked at um, what else? I've I've looked at a Tissot PRX as well. You know, all yeah, 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 all yeah. over the board. Um, as I mentioned, the Glasshütte original seventies Panorama Date is another one. Yeah, that's a good for you. That's yeah, suitable, yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, you know, of course, I've looked at the Nautilus and the Royal Oak, but. They're pretty much unachievable for me. You know? I've looked at the Nautilus. <laughs> I've looked at my bank balance. <laughs> uh, yes. And balance is not the right word. It was very imbalanced. <laughs> the lack thereof. There was a lack of balance. So, yes. Yeah, so, I'm considering the Glasshütte original 70s. I've looked at the IWC Ingenieur as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and of course, the stainless steel Santos. Oh, yes. Y- yes. I'm That's considering true. the medium white face stainless steel Santos because um, it's pretty much the first ever wristwatch. It's an integrated bracelet watch. And this year, well, the new, with the latest release, the bracelet is freaking awesome. You know, it's adjustable. It comes with a leather strap as well as the bracelet, and you don't need any tools. I just love the idea. Can I give you a piece of advice? Yes. I think you're going to need to go a bigger size than the medium. I think the medium is a good size, but I just think I think the large or the extra large. You know, it's it's funny. It's really funny, right? Um, okay, I tried the large, the one with the date mm-hmm. window. I tried yep. the large in the blue and in the white. Yep. And, you know, I tried them on my wrist and I thought, yeah, it's a good size. And when I – and I've looked at it in photos and they seem large. And I'm going to ask this, the name implies. And I looked at uh, the medium as well. And I like mm-hmm. the fact that it doesn't have a date window, so it's quite clean. Anyway, I tried – when I went, I went into Cartier and had a look. And the large – did look huge until I put it on my wrist. Yeah. And, yeah. And I'm in two minds. Mm. I honestly don't know. I mean, I think both look good and I'd be happy with either one, but I'm still considering. I think you unlock them you a couple more dial variations if you if you go up to the large. Um, but it, the the thing about this the Santos and the Santos Dumont is you can really wear Get away with wearing medium, large, extra large, and they're all the just the proportions are amazing. So you can get up, you, like any wrist size can basically pull off hmm. medium through extra large. Yeah, hmm. yes, yeah. really. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and I think it's really I, I'm, I'm surprised. Like for me, and this is c- correct me, um, Jerry, if I'm wrong, but I if I think of style guy getting into watches, I immediately think Rolex and Cartier, like right. The, and I wonder if that – does that track for you or are you sort of, you know, re- reluctant to go down the, the maybe the more expected route? Well, there is a bit of that. But the it's the funny thing, Felix. It's You know, I'd never noticed the Santos till now. But yeah, right. now that I have, I'm seeing them everywhere on Instagram. <laughs> They're being photographed all the time. Jake Gyllenhaal's wearing it. Yeah. Jake, bloody Jake. <laughs> Bloody Jake, yeah. Flex and his Santos. <laughs> and, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm seeing them everywhere, so much so that I'm reading articles that uh, distributors are finding it hard to get stainless steel Santoses. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it's yeah. kind of going the way of the sub. We'll get, get it before it's hot. Well, you know. Yeah, I still it's look at hot. the Santos Dumont, the two-tone. And, yeah. you know, despite being a quartz watch, I really uh, still kind of want one. Yeah, quartz is cool. Um, where are you on quartz, Jerry? Do you uh, are you snobby about it, or would you consider it because that's lacking in your collection? You don't have anything quartz. There? That's true. So I've looked at um, spring drives as well, Grand yep. Seikos. Yeah. Surely I was going to say Grand Seiko. It's yeah. Not quartz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not quite. Not quite. I'll, I'll send it to you. I've got I've got a, uh, a quartz Grand Seiko. It's incredible. It's uh, and again on the wrist. Um, yep. It's it's truly truly wonderful watch. Just yeah, I, I can't speak highly enough of of Grand Seiko's quartz. And this is I, I know this is a bit of a sidetrack. I reckon I've worn it the most because you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you know, you can just grab it and go. You know, it doesn't have to set it anything like that. It's, yeah, I'm I'm gonna go to bat for Team Grand Seiko. Team quartz. quartz. Yeah, oh, I always the, do. The finishing is outstanding. Yeah, it's a lovely watch. Beautiful lines, beautiful polishing. Fantastic. Yeah, there's well, lots of choices, lots of choices. Well, we're excited to see where it goes and where you land. I think, you know, finishing on Cartier seems quite strong and it sounds like a brand that would uh, would fit in quite nicely, maybe something a little bit more more dressy to go with the JLC. But, Jerry, what we do uh, at the end of – end of an episode is we asked for a recommendation i was going to ask you for a sweater recommendation but i think we've got about three from you <laughs> so drop us a recommendation something you've been enjoying could be a podcast could be a book could be a netflix show whatever it is that you think the people listening now would enjoy and we'll say thank you jerry for telling me about this yeah we'll do 
Um, what now? Or yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Saying, yeah. I'm I, on the spot. On, I, you're yeah, on I'll the give spot. you. We'll just chat to each other for like maybe 10, 15 seconds, <laughs> while you furiously go through your Netflix. I'll, I'll drop. I'll drop one. Felix gave me okay. um, our flags mean death. The the TV show. Are you back on that, Andy? I'm back on it. I hung out till like the third or fourth episode. Yep. Yeah. Uh, where Taiki comes in, and it just yep. became. It just changed the whole show for me. Yeah. Happy Pride, yeah, everyone. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Pirate Pride. <laughs> um, so well, I've, I'm back on. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what I've been watching. It's sure. uh, it's a Spanish series called Wrong Side of the Tracks. Okay. And it's pretty cool. It's um, it's kind of – there's a bit of revenge. There's, there are some laughs in there, but it's a pretty serious show, and it's really well written. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of recommendations – Wrong side of the tracks. On Netflix, by the way. On Netflix, on Netflix, yeah. I think I've seen a trailer for it and I'm like, oh, yeah. this looks two too seasons. intense for me. It's, it's two seasons on there, so it's worth, you know, it's worth investing. It's not hasn't been cancelled after one season, so that's yep. positive. Yep, yep. There is a second season. <laughs> Fantastic. And I think all of those uh all of the sweater recommendations are available on Mr. Porter as well. Whoa. They should be. Yep. So I'm I'm looking at some uh sweaters yep. as I freeze. This you know eight degree I'll, day. I'll chuck well, some you, links in. Alternatively, <laughs> just reach out on Instagram. Reach out to me on Jez's eyes on Instagram. Happy mm. to help. Happy to give recommendations. You know, post questions. I'll answer them. The sweater that's plug. That's yeah. Standing. Look and definitely um, give give Jez's eyes a follow because we, we all we're all waiting with bated breath to see what watch comes next mm. and how well, quickly. And you know me. As soon as I get it, you're going to find out. Yeah. On the same day or the day after. So. <laughs> Yeah, you won't need to – your breath won't be too baited. Let's do it that way. <laughs> nice. Fair enough, fair enough. Thank you so much for joining us, Jerry. Thanks for having me on, guys. Our Take pleasure. care. Have a great day. Well, Jerry, I hope you're li- enjoying your uh, holiday at, at the time that this is airing and you're listening to this. Um, hopefully the humidity isn't getting to you and you left all your nits at home, but maybe not all your watches. Uh Thank you, Jerry. That was incredible. Andy, who else do we need to thank? Everyone. RWC, Art of Straps, everyone in our Discord, everyone, uh, you know, leaving five-star reviews. Everyone, everyone listening. Our, everyone listening. Thanks to Chris from the uh, Fourth Wheel for the little shout-out in his newsletter the other day. That was nice. Adam, so- Adam Sandler for creating films and, and content for us to enjoy. And- Matthew Riley for your uh, newspaper thrillers. Newspaper airport. Airport thrillers. That's what yeah, we're and, about. yeah, I mean, he's got so many books. Uh, thank you, Felix. Thank you, Andy. See you next week. Probably. Potentially. Maybe not. This is it, last episode. Call it. Whatever. It's done. Bye.